in the social sector, we get so caught up with numbers sometimes and impact and variety of impact that we sometimes undermine the quality of the impact. Quality to me has become the most important and not the quantity where for a long time I was really, really focused on the quantity. And more recently, and I think that it was after losing my sister, what I realized we had done so much work in early detection, provided over 50,000 procedures, done all this transformative work in, in the screening deficit in our country. And I was like, I haven't met one person. I don't know anybody I've helped. I lost my sister breast cancer. Once you have that aha wake up moment, for me, it was more important than ever to know the people I was helping. And that's when Barbell's Reviews transformed for me. Welcome to Cause and Purpose, the show about the leaders, innovators, and change agents working on the front lines to solve some of the world's greatest social challenges. I'm Mike Spear. And today's guest is the founder and chief mission officer at Barbells for Boobs, Zayana Hansen. This is a really special episode for me. Z and I have been friends for many years. We've done webinars together, presented at conferences, and I've always admired her organization's rapid success and irreverent take on a cause that has more than its fair share of established brands. Barbells for Boobs is a breast cancer organization focused on early detection and providing resources for survivors to thrive after diagnosis and treatment all through the lens of physical, mental, and emotional fitness. Inspired by her best friend's breast cancer diagnosis at age 26, Z sprang into action and Barbells for Boobs was born. Enjoy the episode. So I've been looking forward to this for a while just because we've spoken together before. We did a webinar, we did a thing at Dreamforce. Always love teaming up with you. I feel like we actually have a few things in common in terms of like how we got into the social sector. I think we both had a little bit of roundabout. <laughs> roundabout way. <laughs> yeah. When I look at my own, you know, perspective on the social sector, you know, I have this white upper middle class, like average dude sort of, <laughs> that's how I entered the world. <laughs> and I feel like you actually had the opposite experience. So I never asked you about this, but what was Z like as like a little girl? Like, where did you get your start? <laughs> We're starting from the beginning. <laughs> oh, my gosh. OK. Uh, <laughs> I, want, I want to know what little Z was like running around in what, Long Beach, was it? Oh, yes. I'm from Long Beach, California. So I, I have a really, I want to say, a unique upbringing. And I think that we'll call it eclectic. So I grew up in the desert until I was about eight years old and had a pretty actually awesome childhood. Uh, my dad was the coach to all of our little league teams. Like there was five of us. so. My mom is Mexican. Uh, my dad is white, but very soulful. So had a, had a little culture, lots of culture in him, you know, so a little swag. I know that my father's dream, he always says that if he could redo life, he would want to be a college basketball coach. That's his passion was basketball. And I really think that he was striving to build his own basketball team with our little clan. Uh, so there's two boys, three girls. And I was I was the youngest for about five years. And then my little sister came along and basically ruined that for me. <laughs> Damn her. Damn her, Sandra. <laughs> and, you? you know, we were just kind of like desert rats, you know, just played in the dirt all day long. <laughs> and everything typical that you could think of of growing up in the desert is pretty much what it is. And then my dad decided to live his truth and left my mom uh, when I was eight years old, left her for a really close family friend. It definitely... I think that that was a really pivotal time in my life. My dad had a, a really heavy drinking um, problem. My mom was a stay at home mom. I was really close with her, really typical childhood. And then that kind of just shocked us. And, you know, I'm sure very hard for my father to admit that he was in love with somebody else and ripped up our family. And I think that my mom just didn't know how to handle such heavy news and such heartbreak. My mom kind of went on a, paths of uh, heroin and and drugs and just kind of disappeared and didn't want to be a part of our lives. And then my dad with this new woman, um, she had three kids. And so he moved us all to Long Beach and it took him about a year to get us all. But I remember he asked us all, he came to visit us one day and he asked us all to write on a piece of paper who we wanted to stay with, mom or dad. 
And he wanted us to write it on a piece of paper because we were all so close. He, like he genuinely wanted to know where we wanted to be and not like raise our hand or not say, I want to be with mom or dad. He was like, write it down. So I know where you want to be. And I was the only one that wrote my dad. And so I was um, shipped off to my dad by myself. And I lived with my dad without my other siblings for about a year. And they slowly trickled in. And then after that, my mom, she was she was fighting for custody for all of us. And then eventually it was like, oh, I don't want Z. I'll fight for the other kids. Um, and then it was like, oh, I don't want Mike and Charlene. I'll fight for Sandra and Vance. Um, and then eventually she just didn't show up for court. And so my dad won custody of all of us. And that's how we ended up in Long Beach. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so grew up in in the on the west side of Long Beach with all of us five kids. Our stepmom had three kids. There was eight of us in a two bedroom house uh, that had a back house, and you know just got exposed to such cool stuff in Long Beach that the desert doesn't bring. Um, my brother was the quarterback for Long Beach Poly, uh, so while our complexion wasn't a normal complexion in the neighborhood, uh, even though my mom's Mexican, you know, you look at me, I'm I'm white with green you know, green eyes and blonde hair. Uh, she always said that. People People thought she was my nanny, but whatever. I am half Mexican. <laughs> you know, so we had a lot of respect in the neighborhood because my brother was a quarterback. But it was definitely an interesting place to grow up. Our neighbors were Simone. I didn't know what Simones were. So like being educated on all the different Long Beach is so diverse. I mean, from a culture perspective, so many different cultures that it, it was just really intriguing to me to grow up there and get to know things other than, you know, and where I grew up, it was mainly white and a few black families that, of course, my dad was best friends with all of them. And we got hated on a lot from that. And dad, my dad was always just very, very like people are people and you got to love everybody. But, um, you know, by the time I was 15, I was out of the house. I was my dad was drinking. I gotten to a place where uh, I just maybe just didn't feel safe in my house anymore. And so um, I slept on my brother's couch. <laughs> And he charged me $100 a month when I was 16 years old. And so really like my brother, my older sister kind of raised me from then. So from 15 on and just kind of um, took me under the wings. We uh, took on our little sister. So she was about nine. And so all of us got a house together. So there was a five of us while I was in high school. Everyone called us the party of five. And, and then eventually everyone kind of went to college or my sister had a baby. She took my little sister. So I was left alone my senior year. And um, our neighbors across the street had a motor home in their backyard. So they offered me to live there for my senior year in high school. So I lived in a motor home that last year to get myself through high school. And then I moved to Seattle for massage school. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had an instinct that it might have been some adversity, but I had no idea. <laughs> That's, like, That's like a tidbit, too. That's like the. <laughs> no, no, of course. That's of like course. the really surface level of Z growing what, up, who Z was running around. What do you think made the difference? I mean, I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, but it would have been very easy to go down a negative path mm -hmm. like in life. Like, what do, you, what do you think about your personality or your your uh, the influence of adults and, and friends and family around you that, that like made the difference for you where you got yourself through high school and college? Uh, you know, I think that my older siblings were really influential uh, for me. My brother started his own landscaping company when he was 16. This is the best lesson in life. This just should tell everyone where I come from and like really who raised me and how I turned out the way I did. So my oldest brother, kind of like a father figure to me at this point, I asked him I needed to borrow $2,500. Someone crashed my car. Long story. I needed $2,500 to get this other car that I had put a deposit down or else I'd lose the deposit. And so out of urgency, I asked my brother to borrow $2,500. And he looked at me and he's like, what are you doing on Saturday? And I was like, oh, nothing. And he's like, OK, well, be ready at 630 a.m. and wear comfortable clothes. I said, OK, no problem. Got ready. And he had me go on one of his routes, his landscaping routes and mow lawns. And so I mowed lawns all day and it was the hardest. Like I can remember the pain to this day. Like it was the hardest, laborious day of my life. And we got back home and he wrote me a check for twenty five hundred dollars. And he said, I just wanted you to know how hard I work for my money. And I was like, wow. That next day I went down to school or what that next Monday I went and got a school loan and I paid him back because I was like, I'd rather be in debt with the government than with you ever, ever again. I'm never borrowing money from you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so I have good credit with my oldest brother. <laughs> awesome. I, I, there's so many things that connect with what I know about barbells and how you work today. Just, this, is, this is another area I think we connect is like there was no like direct career path for me to like the social sector. Like no. I, 
you know, I was in the film industry for a while. I did journalism. I was, I played poker for a little bit and then I, you know, discovered classy and that was kind of like mm-hmm. my turn into the sector. Like what were some of the careers that you've had? I don't think anybody in the sector really has a direct path. I think now maybe more people are aware of the sector and going to school now for it. But, you know, you look back 20 years ago when I was getting out of high school, there wasn't like nonprofit wasn't this like, oh, go. And I think that I always wanted to help people. The way I helped people in my career was uh, I went to massage school. So I knew I was going to have to put myself through college. And I knew my oldest brother was not going to help me. <laughs> well, you had such good credit. What are you talking about? I was also a pharmacy technician. So I went, I worked at a pharmacy from the time I was 14, like delivering medicine. And uh, so I became, a, I was a pharmacy tech, but I knew on a pharmacy tech salary, I wouldn't be able to afford college and work 40 hours a week. So I was like, what kind of job could I have where I could still help people maybe work 20 hours a week, but make the same amount of money. And so massage was kind of like that answer. Um, And I was always fascinated with healing people. Like that was always my fascination. And so in pharmacy, I kind of had this idea of, okay, you can give people medicine and then they feel better afterwards. And then it was like, oh, you can, you can touch people and then they feel better afterwards. And so I always in awe of the outcome of making people feel better. And you had these different tactics. And so throughout my life, um, I still practice massage to, to this date. I love it so much. It's meditating for me. It's something that I'll always do. But then I got, you know, I became a bartender and the same outcome, like, okay, you, you serve people drinks and they leave your bar happier or feel better. And there's some type of therapy in there. Little go-go dancing in the middle of there somewhere. <laughs> Probably where I got my first funding for Barbell's Reviews. Anyways, uh, more on that later. <laughs> And then I found CrossFit and that was again, okay, I can coach somebody and give them physical activity and then they leave the gym feeling better. And so everything I've always done in my career going into building barbells for boobs, the outcome was always, I want to make people better. I want them to feel better. I want to heal them in a sense. So um, it just scaled differently. So with massaging, it was one-on-one, you know, and um, in pharmacy was one-on-one in CrossFit and coaching a CrossFit class. It was like, wow, I could help 12 people at once and building barbells for boobs can kind of look at that. We get to heal people by the hundreds, you know, and it's such a cool evolution. And that's why I think massaging is still really important to me is because it grounds me back to just healing one person at a time. And it makes me think more clearly. And it really does ground me and helps me become better at barbells for boobs. That's interesting. I think a lot about working locally versus globally. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there's things you can do at a macro level and serve hundreds or thousands of people, but it's, it's, you don't have the same emotional detachment, even though your impact is so much greater, potentially, like it, you're so disconnected from it. But to be able to work one on one with somebody, it's yeah. a much different experience. Totally different. And it's totally I think in the in the social sector, we get so caught up with numbers sometimes and impact and variety of impact that we sometimes undermine the quality of the impact. Quality to me has become the most important and not the quantity where for a long time, I was really, really focused on the quantity. And more recently, and I think that it was after losing my sister, what I realized I had never, we had done so much work in early detection, like provided over 50,000 procedures, done all this transformative work in, in the screening deficit in our country. And I was like, I haven't met one person. I don't know anybody I've helped. But then when you have such a, I lost my sister breast cancer. I Once you have like that aha wake up moment, for me, it was more important than ever to know the people I was helping. And that's when Barbell Shrews transformed for me. I want to get to this stuff, but I also want to kind of deconstruct the journey a bit more. This is is out there in the world already, but give us the founding story. (laughs) Founding story of Barbells for Boobs. So 2009, I was building my CrossFit gym in Lake Forest, California, dedicated my life to it so much that I was living in the gym because there let's all face it. There's not a lot of money in running a CrossFit gym. Me and my partner, we, we lived in our gym. That's how dedicated we were. Took showers at the 24 hour fitness down the street. Uh, I was probably like nine months into it. And I received an email from my best friend saying that 10 days prior, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And it really shocked me because I was 29. She was 27. Actually at the time that she was diagnosed, she was 26 when she found her lump originally. Like my heart just dropped because I was like, breast cancer happens at 40. 
what that also tells me even to this day is I was uneducated about breast cancer, that this world around us that tells us that breast cancer happens after 40, I was a victim to that stat, you know, breast cancer doesn't happen. And the unfortunate fact is one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime and 7% of those women will be under 40. And so my friend now was a part of this really small stat. I was shocked and not really knowing what to do to support her. I was just like, okay, well, um, my community kind of came together and they're like, oh, like, let's do something. And so, you know, if this is a challenge, I want to kind of challenge myself. If Ceci can get through cancer and do all this stuff, I'm not only going to challenge myself, but I'm asking my friends and we're going to raise money and we're going to raise money for her. Uh, I told her what we were doing and she's like, that's awesome. Like, I'm not saying don't do a fundraiser, but I don't need the financial support. So we, we did this fundraiser and afterwards we went to a bar and uh, one of the participants was like, hey, we just did barbells for boobs. And I was like, what? <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> He's like, we just did barbells for boobs. And something about it just clicked for me. And I said, do you mind if I use that? It's really where Barbells for Boobs was born. And, you know, I, we raised $2,000. We, I saw Greg Glassman, the founder of CrossFit the next week, and he matched it. So we had $4,000 and my best friend, Ceci, <laughs> didn't take it. She was like, go help other people. And that's the founding story. And so through her selflessness and through a few pitchers of beer, yeah, Barbells for Boobs was born that, that week. <laughs> so, that's an interesting moment for me because I, I knew the founding story. You know, I've known that story for years. I didn't realize that that first fundraiser was for Ceci, was like for medical expenses or whatever, mm -hmm. for her. Yeah. Where did you go from like just trying to support your friend to like, hey, this is something we want to turn into an organization potentially? The light bulb moment for me, I actually had a few in the very beginning. Number one, it was Ceci's ask for me to help others. So that was kind of like, okay, well, I have to do something serious with this $4,000. So I started doing some research and I found um, there was a lot of gaps in the screening process for young women just in our country in general. And so I was kind of amazed by that in a way. And the other thing was at that time, one of my coaches in my gym, her cousin was a freelance photographer and found a lump on her breast. And she was like 32 and couldn't afford the services. She couldn't afford the biopsy. It was like, that was like a sign from the universe. Uh, her screening was the first screening we paid for. And our board actually paid for that because we utilized the first $4,000 to get our nonprofit status and hired an attorney. We did it all correctly. And so we didn't have any money left after that. And I was like, all right, we did it. <laughs> we have no money in the bank. Now, how do we do this? Like, what do we do? Um, <laughs> We did it. Yes, we have a nonprofit. <laughs> awesome. Now what? Uh, <laughs> and so our board kind of put some money together. And, um, and and the craziest part was we called the center where she was getting the screening and they were willing to negotiate with us because we were a nonprofit where they wouldn't negotiate with the patient. And and that, that was another like, what is wrong with the system? Like, why can't you can't why can't you just help people? And the entire board just chipped in and paid for it. And so that was a really big that was the aha moment of, oh, wow, like this is a problem. And Ceci's not the only story. And Ceci had insurance, so she didn't actually have a problem. I was just Ceci's the, the, the fire for me on Ceci's story was when she went in originally for her screening six months prior, they denied her screening saying she was too young. And that was really what set me off to say, well, what's happening with young women? Why are they rejecting young women? Like you went in with a lump and they told you you were too young for a screening and then didn't give you a screening. <laughs> like, what, what is this? Like, I felt like our healthcare system failed her. And I, at the same time, am working in this very proactive way and my life's journey has been helping people and healing them. Isn't that what our healthcare system is supposed to do? And why didn't they do that? So, um, yeah, there was a few aha moments in that time. I, I do think that's where some of the best organizations come from. Is that like the personal experience of firsthand experience with this? There's something not right or harder. And then how do I solve that? Oh, yeah, you're a problem fixer. That's like you're a problem solver as in the nonprofit sector. Yeah. Like you're just um, that's all you're doing. You're seeing problems and you're doing your best to articulate a solution. I know Barbells has evolved a lot over the years, but what was the primary mission? Like the, the first, like this is what Barbells is today when we start. For me, it was ensuring that everyone had a right to know that they were living with breast cancer. So that idea that my friend was had breast cancer and she didn't know. And so uh, that's what really we set forth was um, ensuring that regardless of your age, gender, creed, insurance status, that you could get screening and get access to, to an early detection screening.
peer to peer fundraising now is more or less mainstream. But uh, <laughs> at that time, it was Barbells for Boobs, that first event was basically peer to peer fundraising. In 2010, CrossFit picked up my story and kind of shared it with the community. And after they shared it, everyone came out, came up to me. I was reaching out to us and was like, how do we get involved? How do we get involved? And I didn't know what peer-to-peer fundraising was at that time. And everyone was giving us $35 because they wanted the Barbell Tribute shirt. And we had, I think the first year, 5,000 people register. We raised like $300,000. I was like, wow, what did I just, you know, like, what is this? So then you have the funds. And then I was completely lost. I was like, <laughs> and then what do I do? I was like, oh, now what? Wow. And that's a, when people ask me when that are like, want to start a nonprofit and they're like, what's what's your first piece of advice? Have a plan. <laughs> 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 know the problem. <laughs> Make sure no one else is trying to solve that problem. If you find somebody trying to solve that problem, call them. <laughs> <laughs> See how you can help them <laughs> solve the problem. If no one in the world is solving this one problem, have a plan <laughs> before you ask for money. <laughs> You raised the four grand, you spent the four grand, you're out of money. Now you've got 300. <laughs> it's like, what do we do? So, but those were all small donors. Those were all 30, $35. $35 gifts. Yeah. That really bring, that brings me to the, the core of what I'm getting at here is like, you've made most of your revenue, especially in the early days off of those small donations. Mm-hmm. What has that meant for the growth of the organization to have that broader base of support, all the sort of human capital, the community aspect to it? And how did you engage with those people and thank them with like a tiny team in a way that like made sense and they wanted to like stick around and be a part of it. So it's so important to have, I feel that type of funding where if you lost a donor, it doesn't, you know, collapse any of your programs. Um, So we've been really fortunate to have a consistent uh, database of really great, you know, small givers, a large amount of small givers. And that was the first year I was in such shock that so many people felt my fire in the story of Ceci and knew that she was done wrong. Right. And so it was like that idea that you guys just heard my Ceci story. And then we also pushed out a video and this is where like marketing, marketing your story, telling your story. So important. I give a a lot of credit to the CrossFit community because if it wasn't for the CrossFit community, it wouldn't have reached so many people overnight. So the minute that CrossFit released our story. I think it was October 8th, 2010. Overnight, we raised like $62,000. Oh, wow. And then I had like 2,132 emails in my inbox. It went from a, I was grinding and I was fighting and advocating to like, wow, people are just as angry as me. And like, people believe in this problem. And I have now an army that wants to support this problem. And so that to me was just like, how do I thank these people? Oh my God, Sally in Texas, that's like emailing me every two weeks. And so the only tangible way I thought about helping people or thanking them was meeting them. And so the next year we set off and did a tour across the country and go to, we went and visited as many people, as many CrossFit gyms as we could in 30 days. I think we hit like 23 gyms all the way across the country. And that wasn't a fundraising thing. That was literally to go thank all the donors. I just wanted to thank everybody. Yeah. That's incredible. It was. What was the response to that? Incredible. Still to this day, people are like, when is the tour coming back? <laughs> <laughs> and it grew. You know, the first year it was, you know, we rented a Sprinter van. I don't think we ate for a few days, you know, like, but we brought a DJ and, you know, I was like, I just want to have a party and have fun and like make this ugly thing that we're trying to fix fun. And, and along the way you meet survivors and you meet people that have been impacted by breast cancer and they're sharing their stories, but we just try to make it the funnest, livest thing that was happening in October. And so we did the tour, I think six more years to a point where we had motorhomes and, you know, people were so amped when the motorhome showed up. You started to mention marketing, which Mm -hmm. is always overlooked in the social sector for better, for worse. Uh, some organizations only need to worry about it, but in general, I think it's a very undervalued thing. Um, you've, you've always been great at marketing and in particular, I felt the brand has always been very strong. Breast cancer is one of those things where at least as an outsider, I guess, to me, it seems like it's very saturated with organizations trying to impact that cause and whatever their way is. And for the casual donor, who's like, I want to get involved in breast cancer. It strikes me that it'd be very difficult to know how to pick the right organization. And your brand stands apart. Have you invested in the brand and how has that made a difference for you? To me, I feel like that's what connects people. And that's what makes people want to be a part of something is the story. And that's how we're all connected is through a story. Even because regardless if you're going to listen to my story or to Karen's story or to anybody's story, it's 
you have to kind of feel like you can fix the problem that we're trying to solve, you know? And so I think that we did a really good job in investing in pr- video production and get making sure we always had uh, a camera following us around, especially when we were on tour. I mean, we had people commit to you know, six weeks on the road with us and not only an investment in dollars, but people's time. And they were so inspired by what we were doing that a lot of sometimes people were just like, I don't care. Just give me a camera and I'll I'll come and just pay for my room and board for the six weeks and I'll come and, and, and roll with you guys. And so uh, so we always made sure we had a camera following us around. We always made sure that we were asking people to share their story and and listening for those stories. But as far as the brand from a look and feel, I interviewed so many survivors before I put Barbell Straboobs out in the world because I wanted to hear from them what it felt like to have cancer, right? So I don't, I've never had breast cancer, so I don't know what it feels like. And the just I got from those interviews is really still what exists in our brand right now is a lot of women wish that breast cancer was black because it's not this pretty pink cancer and they've lost so many friends to it that they would rather honor the darkness of it than the light. They hate the ribbon. They think that the ribbon has robbed them of something and there's a lot of conspiracies to the the ribbon. Um, And so if you you really look at our brand, we don't use a ribbon. We use a circle because I feel like Barbell for Boobs is really worried about the cycle of life and making sure that we're just bringing life into into what you're going through specifically. And we use a lot of black. And again, you start building this brand, not knowing what's ahead understanding that death is a part of breast cancer. And we wanted to make sure that that was relevant in our brand. You brought up a couple of interesting points I just want to touch on, you know, with having this broad base of supporters, having a storytelling be a part of it, you really invited your community in to be a part of Barbells and to have a, feel like they have a stakeholdership in it, you know, drawing the, doing the interviews with survivors and stuff like that. And I've also noticed that on your website now you can download the color schemes, download mm-hmm. the pictures. Like how was what do you play with, with with preserving like the integrity of the brand that you've established versus like giving it up for others to use and be a part of and make it their own? Honestly, for us, it was more about I'd rather give permission and let more people share their story of Barbells for Boobs than protect it because we're, we protect it in a way of we are very conservative on who we work with and who we partner with at a headquarter level, but how the community wants to represent barbells for boobs is up to them. Like I tell owners that all the time. I'm like you hosting a barbells for boobs event in your community. I honestly don't care what it looks like. Just have fun. As long as you're saying barbells for boobs and you understand what your community is giving back to. We've never been like, we, we tried to kind of control that. And then I was like, there's 3000 events happening. You guys, how are we going to control this? And there's some things that you just have to be like, does it matter? As long as we as an organization give them the tools to keep the brand as consistent as possible. Um, and that's when we just said, you know, like, let's just give it to them because they're they're actually the ones in the trenches doing all the work to raise the money. Why wouldn't we give them our assets? They're part of our company. And so you kind of almost if they trust us. So that so much that they're putting on an event in their own community and raising money for us, we have to trust them with our brand. You seem like you are very much an ask for forgiveness and not permission kind of person, (laughs) which is rare. It's like it's unique in the nonprofit sector. Everybody's like so concerned about not to say you should be reckless, but concerned about what their board's going to say, getting Mm -hmm. approved for different things, not angering donors for like some perceived misuse of whatever. Because it seems very central to who you are as a leader and the spirit of Barbells for Boobs. How have you used that? Is it ever like blown up in your face? Like, what, what's, oh yes, <laughs> give, give me, give, like, I think I'm onto something here. But like, uh, to flesh it out for us. You know, it's so hard because you know we're asked to solve these massive issues, right? Asked to solve these massive issues with all this red tape and our hands tied behind our back. There, there comes a point where you just kind of have to say fuck it, and you have to. There's nobody that has the intuition like a founder. Nobody. I've asked for forgiveness and it's been where I had so much belief and vision that I was like, Z, this matters so much that if in the out, if the outcome is they kick you off of barbells for boobs, it's worth it. Honestly, here's how I make decisions. This is honestly the secret to Z's decision making. Would Ceci be mad at me? Would would it make Ceci proud? Would Ceci be proud with this? And if I can go to sleep and say, could I tell Ceci and would she be proud of this? 
then I make the decision. Probably not the most strategic. I'm not advising this to everybody, but, but when you say, when you take risks and you have to like think about your board and what you need to bring to your board's light and what do you not. And at the, I've, I've been very lucky to have some board chairs where they're like Z, as long as you're hitting your numbers, I don't care how you get there, do what you need to do to hit those numbers. Um, and so I think that that's when I was the most innovative innovative leader was when I had a board chair that was like, I trust you. I trust you're not going to make a decision that's going to compromise the organization. Sometimes you might have to think abstractly and need to ask me for something. Go ahead and ask me, but I trust you to do the right thing. And so I think at the end, if you can say I did the right thing, then I'm okay with it. (laughs) I'm okay with the decision. (laughs) Yeah. But when you say, when you say would Sassy be proud, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody's imagining you're going to call Ceci in the morning and be like, "Hey, what'd you think about this?" Yeah, no, I know. she's representative of having a strong mission and core values mm-hmm. um, and vision for the organization. Whenever I do any any sort of work with a client or whoever, I, I just want to check in on like that ethos and like mm-hmm. either create it if it's not there or redevelop it or make sure like that's dialed in. Bef- like, doesn't matter what. Like we can make a social media or like a giving Tuesday. It doesn't matter. As long as you put it through that lens of what the core values are, you know, the rest is just communication, right? You, you don't want to like, you want to have good communication with the board, with any of your stakeholders. But it, I feel like as long as you're putting it through those values, like you should be okay, right? Yeah, 100%. And, and honestly, Ceci, you've now kind of had a, a little sneak peek in, in my upbringing. And Ceci was very integral in my my upbringing and was the one friend that really taught me what unconditional love was. And people always ask me like, what's the most proud thing that Barbell Shred Boobs is that they like, what's, what are you most proud of, of Barbell Shred Boobs? And the thing I'm most proud of is that Ceci's still my best friend. Mm. 11 years later, like that's still my ride or die. And like, so I haven't lost the vision of Ceci and what she represents in my life and the gift that she gave me, which was unconditional love. And so I just try to pay that forward to everyone. Barbells for Boobs has been tied to CrossFit since the outset. Have you felt any pressure to grow beyond that? A little bit, yeah. Um, I, I think that that's the challenge of Barbells for Boobs. You know, I've, I've had a lot of pressure to change the name. I've had a lot of pressure to expand out of CrossFit. And, and I think that what I've learned the most is I don't really care about that. I did for a while. And I, and I did in the very beginning of this idea of grow, grow grow, get bigger, more, more impact, 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 grow the numbers. Cause we were growing at such a rapid pace for years, six years, we were doubling our revenue every single year. And so having that pressure every year to double, and then the year you don't, and you drop, it's like, Oh, failure. I, I it was so hard on myself that you kind of lose why you start because you're now so worried about the numbers that I don't care anymore about. I care about, again, the quality now. And um, right now we're, we're serving 200 women pretty much every day. I mean, our women are, we're so, we're, we're probably engaged with our, the women we serve, probably about 20% of them every single day right now. I guess I don't, not that I don't care about growing, but I care about staying true to what it is that we do and staying in our lane and not trying to be something that we're not. Yeah. And so if we can replicate what we're doing in cycling and have a full on community and support and coaching and and programming. And now that we're what we're doing in breast cancer, because it's obviously evolved. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, It's obviously evolved. But, you know, what we're doing today in breast cancer, I think that it could be replicated in different communities and different fitness communities. And we'll see in the next decade how we can copy and paste. I've seen a trend where innovative organizations begin with one issue, like early screenings and the right to know, and then evolve, primarily to add resources around the core mission to ensure program success. In many ways, this forces them to redefine who they are as an organization. Tell us about the RAD program. Uh, Yeah, so the RAD program, it stands for Resources After Diagnosis. Um, And the mission of the RAD program is to provide the tools to women impacted by breast cancer to move daily. And so a a few things happened at Barbells for Boobs uh, in order for the RAD program to really be born. Uh, So we were doing the Right to Know program, which was providing funding for early detection services. We were doing this at a national level. We had, you know, funding in 23 states. Uh, We had a partnership with Avon Foundation. All this amazing stuff because we you know we've always been a small team very grassroots team I don't know if anybody knows this but the Avon Foundation dissolved in 2017 and so you're talking about a 40 million dollar machine that we were partnered with that could mobilize our funding really easily and save us a lot of time and resources was gone 
And so we didn't have this big partner anymore in that space. And then also we were sent, we were kind of at the same time seeing some impact from the Affordable Care Act, where now people are mandated to have insurance. So now the the problem wasn't, I don't have insurance. The problem was I don't have enough money for my deductible. So there's, there was still obviously huge screening deficits. Um, but when we were granting money to a, to a clinic or to a hospital and they couldn't utilize our, our funding was almost working like as an insurance or, and so they would use now this co- person has insurance. Now they have a deductible. Well, we can't pay the deductible. We have to pay the medical provider, not the person. So long story short was we started seeing refunds come back from our grants. And my board was like, hey, Z, if everyone has insurance, do we still exist? Can you solve that problem? And so that was on my mind. At the same time, my sister was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. And so all of that kind of collided within a year. And we also just had, you know, since inception, meeting survivors on the road and listening to their story and and always being a part of the, the aftermath of breast cancer, but not doing any work in that capacity. So. We started saying like, okay, we're doing all this great work in early detection. What about once they get diagnosed? What are we doing? And, you know, women would call and say, yeah, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. My coach told me to call you. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like, you know, you know, like, that's great. We'll send you a shirt. Like, that was like my only solution. Like, we'll send you a barbells review shirt. Cool. You know. And I started saying like, we're only doing half the work. Like we're kind of half ass in this. We need to complete the circle. So if we look at half of the circle is early detection, the other half is after detection. What are we doing on that dark side if the circle is like almost like black and white? And of course, my sister getting diagnosed was really, really what lit the fire. And so my sister was 43, just diagnosed too late, uh, had already spread to her bones and her lungs. And so I just was getting to a place where I was like, this is, I, I went actually to the, to the the president of Avon Foundation at the time. And this is when I found out that they were dissolving. I literally ran to the bathroom and threw threw up when I found out because I don't think people understand what a machine like that was doing for breast cancer and how disgusting it was that they were going to be dissolved. And so I went to her and I said, what are we supposed to be doing? Like it's that time when you're in your the work, right? You're so in, in the trenches and you finally have to ask yourself, Am I doing what we're meant to do or am I just doing what we're supposed to do, what everybody's been telling me I'm doing and I'm doing it so great. When I really looked at the landscape of early detection, I was like, I feel like I'm beating myself with a, it's a black hole. I don't really feel the impact. I don't really understand what we're doing. And when I really sat down and I said, what are we meant to do in breast cancer? And if it took us 10 years to get to what we were meant to be doing, I'm okay with that. And so when I really looked at the landscape of fitness, in breast cancer and what women in our community were telling us that their doctors were saying of don't pick up more than three pounds, don't do a push-up. And then I'm in the chemo chair with my sister and hearing it directly from her medical team. I'm just like, I'm seeing women five years out of treatment, still having hot flashes, five years out of treatment, still having the scars and still dealing with it and still having the depression that breast cancer brings, nobody realizes that once you're done with treatment and you ring the bell, that you have breast cancer for the rest of your life. And not, not maybe an active cancer, but it's, it's there. The scars are there every day, the side effects, especially depending on what type of breast cancer you get. So I started the momentum. I started building what this rad program could be. And then um, my sister passed away in April of 2018. You try to listen to the universe. You try to listen for signs. And then you just, you have to make a decision. And this wasn't a decision I asked permission for my board. You know, it wasn't like, hey, we're, we're changing direction. I just told them this is not what we're doing. If they didn't want to be a part of what, how Barbells for Boobs was evolving and growing and changing. Um, they are more than welcome to leave. And again, would Ceci be okay with this? And here's the beautiful part about what we do now is Ceci's a part of our programs and I'm finally helping my friend that was so reluctant to take the freaking money in the beginning. She's a part of our programs now. And so if the board wasn't okay with it, I was like, I'll start a new organization. What do you need me to do? (laughs) 
right now we're still, we still support early detection. So we still have a get screen. We still navigate women to early detection services. We don't fund them currently, um, but we still have a national network of early detection resources and information. And we are building a really special, we're piloting a program next year uh, for early detection. That's going to be more of a youth program and more providing information to you at risk youth on fitness and breast cancer, making sure that young girls know that you can get breast cancer at 26. You know, how, how has it gone since you launched the RAD program? And what are you hearing back from the participants in terms of how it's impacting them? I can't even talk about it. <laughs> I mean, to go from running impact where, again, you're just chasing numbers and it's cool to get your grant reports back and see all the impact and the numbers and the people you're serving. And but man, to get text messages from people that you get help every day to get packages from them for them to meet your son and really be a part of like your why. And it, it's I can't even describe what we do now. It's something you have to feel. You have to be a part of the programs. And and I think that it's it's kind of like when people ask, like, what's CrossFit? It's like, well, it's something you got to feel. Like, it's a feeling. It's not, it, I can't describe it. How are you reporting back on the, the metrics? I mean, I know those, are, you know, the numbers aren't the end all be all, right? But mm-hmm. how do you think of, of impact now? Mm, if I can get a woman to work out. And so it's really up to them. And I put that pressure on them too. Uh, so the biggest metric we track right now is workouts logged. And so we track every single workout that our women do. You know, I just, I tell them all the time, all of them always ask like, you know, we want to help Barbell Shrews. How do we help? Drag your workout, log your workout into our system. (laughs) That's how you help. (laughs) Um, Because it's really important because right now it's in order for us to change the standard of care and for oncologist to say, yes, work out. Yes. You can pick up a barbell. Yes. You can run. Yes. You can do a push up. We need to show that number one, women can do high intensity training after breast cancer. And so by us logging that metric was the most important one this year for us to log. So our annual goal right now is 30,000 workouts logged um, for a full year with the current participants that we have. And so if we can get that metric, that to us is the most important for us to start kind of moving the needle in fitness after physical activity after breast cancer. Yeah. I know this is sort of a newer program, but we talk about BHAGs and stuff like that. Like, what would it mean if encouraging fitness and exercise and making lifting okay after treatment, if the medical sector, Mm -hmm. you know, accepts this as like, what should be the normal? Like, what would that mean to you guys? That's the dream, right? That's the, the vision is your oncologist is like, yeah, call barbells for boobs. They'll get you all set up <laughs> and, and hooked up, you know, like they'll they'll show you how to get back into because the, the ultimate dream here for me is when you get diagnosed with breast cancer, you have this entire medical team, oncologists, radiologists, all these all these people. And then you you're done. And then they say, this is your new normal. Go figure it out. And there's really no care team after that. And so our goal is to kind of be that new care team. And so really having a head coach in charge of your health, we have a coach that programs specifically. And the goal is, is uh, right now we're onboarding a group of professionals where if we need to outsource um, like nutrition or psychology or physical therapy, that we have some specialists that we work with that, that we can now kind of have a care team for the women for the rest of their lives to say, hey, since physical therapy is not a protocol post mastectomy, I'm not angry about that at all. How about we make sure that you have that and you get that until that is a protocol until we can change that. And so those are some of the like key standards of of care that we want to change. Um, And we're far from that. That's kind of almost secondary, like the improve the quality of life is our priority right now, which I think you move your body, you can start feeling better. If you haven't read Untamed, it's a great book. She has this idea, how do you solve big social problems? And she's like, it's kind of like a river. She's like, you know, you get your, you have people that are pushing people into a river and they're getting stuck into a river. So, you know, the idea of a social uh, social sector is we pull people out of the river, we, we rescue them, you know, get them out of the river. So I kind of feel like that's our improve the quality of life. We're getting them out of the river, but if we don't figure, go back to the top and see who's pushing people in and solve the root cause of the problem, then we're failing the entire system, right? And so our us going to the top and figuring out who's pushing women into, they're not really pushing them into cancer, but who's pushing them into like not feeling better? Like, why aren't they feeling better? It's the medical team. And so it's us saying we need to change the mindset and the industry standard on what to do with physical activity afterwards. And, and as a medical professional, I want to establish a bridge between the medical professional team and the fitness professional community. You know, I think that your why has to be so strong. And if your why isn't strong, then it's not real. You know, I think that it's, if you don't want to quit every day, 
your why isn't strong enough. You know, I, I definitely want to quit every single day. It's hard. This work is hard. There's, you know, I always tell people you're investing in other people every single day. But for me, I'm like, this is, this is our investment. This is our proof of our work is the people that we get to serve. That to me is, is bigger than anything, but yeah, your why has to really stand out. And I wish to God that I, that this wasn't my why. I pray all the time. I thought breast cancer is not a blessing. I'm not happy about this work I do. I hate it. I hate breast cancer. I hate the color pink. And I've tried to walk away. I've tried to like be over it. I, di- I don't want to c- come here. I was just like, I'm done. I'm going to go back to massage. You know, I'm going to build a massage. Practice. I could go do anything, right? I can, <laughs> I could consult. I can go write a book. I, I, I can't. I can't because this is my prophecy. This is what I was put on this earth to do. This is mine. No matter how much I try to deviate from it, it's like, mm-hmm, nice try. I see you. Go ahead, try. Go ahead. Don't worry. And and that's true because I, you know, I resigned as the CEO after my sister passed away, and and I was having a rough day. And I one day I just decided to leave the board, and um, I was building a, my massage practice. And my first patient was a breast cancer survivor that morning. Wow. And I think that it's, it's kind of like this thing where like, you just have to listen to the universe as much as you want to have your own life and do your own thing. As much as I, in my head, I'm like, I'll just go build my own practice, my own wellness center. And maybe I'll give free, (laughs) free treatment to breast cancer survivors. You know, like in my own little cuckoo head, that's what I think. Cause, cause it's hard to run an organization and um, people don't realize that it's not about just raising money. It's building a team, building a culture, um, building trust, continuing to do it year over year and coming up with a new strategy year over year so that you get that $50 donor every single year. That's a, it's a challenge. And I think the only resiliency is you have to be meant to do this. There's literally, this is like, I've got to find, I found my calling at the age of 29 through trauma and devastation. And my only job is to bring light in this world. And for whatever reason, I have no idea. I hope to find out soon. It's through breast cancer and I've just accepted it and I'm here. (laughs) What do you want today? I'm here. (laughs) Now what? (laughs) Shouting into the wind. But I mean, you're you're still so positive and lit up and energized about this stuff. Like what what are the little bright spots, like the things that happen in the course of your work that really just keep you energized and, and keep moving? Oh, man. My team, the people I get to work with, the people I surround myself with. Um, they're just awesome. My son, you know, my son knows what breast cancer is. He's eight and he's autistic, you know, and he works out with our survivors every day and teaching my son that, you know, about my work and about women and women's health. Uh, that's probably the best part of my day. And he knows that, you know, Punzel wears pink, you know, that's Punzel's color. Punzel wears pink. He calls me Punzel and I hate pink, you know, and it's, it's so funny that this is the work I do, but yeah, my team. I get excited to come in here every day. I love it. It's just cool because we get to be positive, right? Not every day, not every moment. Am I like, like there's stuff where I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like what? And and you really deal with some real stuff. Yeah. You know, you really have legal stuff and you really have finance and accounting stuff and big decisions to make and you have to make cuts and hires and make really hard decisions. Those are hard days, you know, when you have to do those things. But for the most part, we have a re- we don't take anything too serious here. We're kind of just like, we, this is good. This is this is all right. And our team, they bring out the joy in me. Awesome. So how has fundraising gone this year in light of COVID? We're hitting our goals by 200 percent right now, which is insane during a pandemic. But that just kind of shows, I think, the strength in our community and people believing in what we're doing and our, our future. It's going to be about telling your story correctly. And we haven't told this, this full story of Barbell Tribus. I haven't shared my sister's story. I haven't shared kind of the evolution and the cycle of why we're doing what we're doing now. And so I think it will be time next year for us to really dig in and invest in a really bigger story, uh, a way that we can really share the projections of our work um, and really the impact of our work and what it's doing. We really will now have a full year of true impact from our RAD program. And uh, we're getting just amazing testimonials right now. A lot of qualitative work happening here. Uh, so I think that we, we just need to f- hunker down the spring, 
a springtime and, and really produce a really good new story. Who is Barbells for Boobs now? Do you know what your donor retention rate is? This is totally random. It's fine if you don't. I don't. I haven't looked at it. I know that we've had a pretty consistent, probably around 80% retention in the last three years. That's huge, mm-hmm. you know, according to industry standards. Mm-hmm. But it's not surprising. That's kind of what I was expecting you to say. Be- be- <laughs> well, because of the way, you know, so many organizations are, are very worried about donor burnout and mm-hmm. things like that. And I'm always telling people, like, just make sure your interactions are value add and make sure you're aligning the mission work with the fundraising work. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, they should really, it should become passionate for them and they should really stick around. You guys have been super successful at that. It Mm -hmm. seems like. Yeah. We're more successful at it now, now that our programs are actually doing the thing that there's an idea of, I know what it feels like to pick up a barbell and I know what it does for my own healing. If I can help a woman pick up a barbell now, like the message of what Barbell Shreboobs does now means more to our donor than ever. I think there was some empathy to like, I can help a woman get a screening but I can help a woman put a barbell in her hands. There's a commonality there that they understand of what a barbell does for themselves. And if I can give that to another person going through cancer, yeah, let's do that. What's next for Barbells for Boobs? I I know the RAD program and, you know, having the program for younger women to make sure they get, they know they should get screened. You also mentioned to me, you know, potentially building a for-profit arm. Like where, where do you see going with barbells over the next you know, one, three, five, ten years. Yeah, I know that we want to be uh, the world's largest global educators in physical activity after breast cancer. That's one of our our big visions. We kind of want to be the place where everyone comes and knows and almost like that. Oh, like you need to go to California because, you know, they're doing some cool stuff at Barbell Shreboobs, you know, like anybody in the world gets diagnosed with breast cancer. Like, oh, man, this spot in California is doing some really cool stuff. <laughs> but, you know, I think that we, we had a kind of this week, this year's been made you question your vision. Big time because you're set on this path and you think that you're doing these great things. And then you realize there's a lot of problems still in our country when it comes to race, privilege, you know, all that stuff. And so, you know, we were challenged during a lot of that stuff, you know, after after Mr. Floyd and the civil unrest that happened this past year, uh, we were definitely kind of question our diversity rate within our community and how are we reaching more women of color? And that really kind of started me saying, how do I, especially coming, I'm I'm from the neighborhood, you know? So I take that stuff to heart. We are moving Barbells for Boobs to the neighborhood I grew up in. Oh, wow. And so for me, I can't solve it until I can solve it in my own community. So for me, I'm like, if I'm going to really dig deeper, deeper into my roots and deeper into helping and serving a wider population. I have to start where I grew up. I have to know what's happening with my community. And I want to show little girls in my community, you can come from here and and do great things and build great things and do good. Uh, That it doesn't, it's not all ugly. This isn't the end of the life of your life. There's, there's hope here. Um, And so that's, that's one of my big initiatives. Again, one, I'm probably not going to ask for, I'm going to ask for forgiveness. (laughs) (laughs) We're moving along. Beach, everyone, West Side. Um, <laughs> but again, I'm like, Sessie would be so proud of that because we're both from the West Side. <laughs> we're both West Side girls, and and you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where there's not a Starbucks, there's not a Target, there's not. It's not a neighborhood where companies go in and invest their 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 money or invest their their product in. And so, I want to bring this to my neighborhood first, and and really start digging deeper into that that topic. And Black women have the highest mortality rate in breast cancer. And not to say that I'm going to solve that problem, but I think that physical activity can really support after diagnosis uh, wellness, you know. And so uh, and and with that, doing a for profit side to where the community can come and be a part of it. And, you know, for if we have end up having uh, different modalities of uh, wellness, so not only a gym, but maybe like a wellness center with different modalities, acupuncture and massage therapy and all my roots stuff. Maybe I'll have a bar there and I'll be slinging some drinks. I don't know. Um, but I want an entire like the campus, you know, where it's in the hood and uh, we're really talking to people that are are struggling in that capacity. And and where I'm from, there's a lot of people where I grew up and they've made it out and they've been successful and I hope that we can have a really good big community that supports it of people that want to get back to the neighborhood I grew up in. So that's kind of like forefront because my rad, our rad program is just rolling. 
it's going to just organically grow. You kind of just, sometimes you have to just let it do what it's going to do. Can't control it too much. You know, uh, I have a great team that runs it. And now I have to kind of think about the bigger problems that are happening in the world and how do we contribute and how we, how, how do we do that, but stay in our lane? How am I doing it, but staying in the lane of breast cancer? That's a great vision. So outside of your mission, you know, something you're not going to get involved in. What do you think is the most important cause at this point that humanity can be working towards? Ooh, yourself. Working on yourself. You are the biggest cause. Um, and so I think that that's the best thing you can be doing right now for the world is looking in the mirror, figuring yourself out, working on your own mental health, um, showing up as the best version of yourself. I think that the more that people can work on themselves and being better human beings, the world would be better. You sort of expressed how breast cancer sort of found you, you know, and, and you saw this need and you took action on it. What advice would you give to other potential founders of organizations when they see something that they want to change? How, how do they spring into action the way you did? Don't do it. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Just careful go back what to bed. You wish for. <laughs> Be careful. It's not, it's not, the grass is not greener. For me, I think that I always tell people, like, figure out what you want to do. Understand the problem you want to solve, because that's really what it is. You know, I've been contacted by so many people of things they want to do and understand the problem and and see, is there anyone fixing it already? And if they are, you're better off collaborating. I'm a huge fan of collaboration than trying to rebuild it. And, and I think that there's a, enough nonprofits in the world. There's enough organizations in the social sector. I don't think that there's some problem that hasn't been thought about of being solved. And not to say that we can't be innovative and do our own thing. And I, I definitely want to advocate for that. But saving time and saving people's energy and dollars, figure out if there's somebody already doing it and go talk to them. Like you don't even want to talk to me as a nonprofit. I guess I would consider myself a master of nonprofits now, not really <laughs> fail every day sometimes. But Go talk to the person that's doing the thing that you want to do or kind that kind of looks like the thing that you want to do. Email them, like call them, do something and reach out to them and talk to them. That's what I would say. Don't do it. <laughs> or find a nonprofit and go work for them and really understand how a nonprofit works. The social sector works. It's a different. It's different. I mean, we've known each other a while, but talking to you now and listening to to the podcast uh, that you put out is you, you really do seem to have grown in that way and become very grounded and are self-assured and understand who you are. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's a testament to the hard work you've put in and the journey you've been on for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think grief will do that. Loss will do that. Loss makes you go so inside. Last question. This is your, this is your big softball for the day. How can people support you and your work? Love that. Fundraise. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, everyone has an opportunity to do something every single year, right? And so to support Barbells for Boobs, fundraise, it means so much to organizations. Just start a page, ask friends, family members. Everyone has been impacted by breast cancer. One in eight women will be diagnosed in their lifetime. So you think about eight women you know, and just think about that stat. I mean, we all have probably eight very close women to us. Fundraising is a way that you get to share this message and continue to talk about this. To us, that's the biggest problem statement. One and eight. That's all I, that's all I have to say. Um, you know, this is impacting our moms, our wives, our sisters, our cousins. Uh, fundraising is the best way that you can be an advocate for breast cancer, for barbells, for boobs um, and the work that we're doing. And, and a lot of times like fundraising means it's you put a challenge on, you do a workout, you do something physically challenging to give back to Barbell Street Boobs. And we reward you with really cool rewards, like a shirt, a hoodie, a Yeti, a barbell. Get with it. So you can go to barbellstreetboobs.org and uh, create an account <laughs> and fundraise. <laughs> and literally it, click take action because that's what it's about. So take action. You can fundraise. You can join the heartbeat. So that's our recurring campaign. So $20 a month is what we ask. And we're probably going to be doing some really fun things with our recurring and give. So taking action in that and, and being a part of what we do every single month. Um, so you can get really an insight on life after breast cancer. Really, it, it's not what you think. You know, you think of one thing of breast cancer and it's not. It's something totally different. And it's so inspiring and fun and dark and crazy and rewarding. And I think that people need this every day in their life. Like 
you, you, you're like, you're so positive and energetic. I'm around people that have been through cancer all day long. If there is not a reason for me to get my butt up and be thankful, I don't know what else is. And so if you get to be a part of our Wells for Boobs and by joining our fundraising initiatives, our, our recurring giving, our being a one-time donor, we're going to give you a little bit, little bit of that gift every time we send you something. Right. And so that's, that's just the inspiration of how lucky we are to be alive and not sick. When you're ready to, to hang up the barbells 50 years from now, <laughs> what would you like to look back and have done with your career in the social sector? What would you like to have accomplished at that point? Oh, I think that the, the thing that would be that what I would consider the biggest accomplishment, let's say on my deathbed is that Barbells for Boobs is still around and still doing great work and still helping women every day. Because it, this work is so hard, it's so easy to fail one year and you're out, to fail one month and you can be out in the social sector, to create a legacy and make sure that it's still there and it's still intact on my deathbed. That would be an accomplishment. Anything else you want to add or anything I should have asked? You know, sometimes I, I leave out the storyline on think people, their hearts drop. I think that, you know, we always talk about what would make us proud or what would we feel accomplished in our work, right? I think that the thing I'm the most proud of in my life is that I have a wonderful relationship with my mom and dad. And so I was re kind of reconnected with my mom uh, three years ago. My father's sober now. And so I think that that's been the biggest character building for me is accepting people for who they are and what they've done, taking them in for the day. Today is a new day and still my parents, like the people that gave me life, like they're just people, they're humans, they mess up. But for me, it's like I have a solid relationship with the both of them is is something that is that helps me in my leadership every day. I feel like complete. Well, I think that's a great place for us to leave it. Thank you very much for listening. And a huge thank you to our guest, Zayana Hansen. If you want to learn more about Barbells for Boobs, check out their website at barbellsforboobs.org. As always, we'll include some additional information in the show notes and link to ways you can get involved on our own website at causeandpurpose.com. We love hearing from you as well. So if you have any comments, questions, or guests you'd like to hear from, please drop us a note through the website. We hope you enjoyed Z's appearance on the show and will join us again next time when our guest will be Maggie Doyne. Maggie is the founder of Blink Now, a children's home and school in Nepal's Kopila Valley. Blink Now was founded when Maggie, fresh out of high school, traveled to Nepal and began to see firsthand the struggle of Nepalese children, many of whom were orphaned in the wake of the Nepalese Civil War. It's a great story and you definitely don't want to miss it. Cause and Purpose is a production of Moonshot.co. On behalf of myself, Z and our entire team, thank you for listening. <laughs>